Anna Maria Tremonti, CBC News. This Zenny is Matthew Zach, Halter Central of the CBC. This is Morty Safer reporting. Josh Hester, CBC News. Weather Journal. This is Anne Peter Medina. Kent for CBC News Magazine. In the 75 years since the CBC first took to the airwaves, its correspondents have traveled a world at war. They've covered conflicts in such diverse places as Serbia and Somalia, Cambodia and Kandahar. Through the decades, you've seen and heard their stories. Tonight, something special, as we hear in their words from some of the many CBC journalists who have helped Canadians understand the causes and the effects of war. I hate to say that he was addicted to war, but he kept on going back to the front. I think when you cover enough wars, you become, you, you become a pacifist pretty quickly. The newest refugees of the Vietnam War. You can see nothing about man's inhumanity to man really surprised me anymore. You were lucky to stay alive. Often it was the civilians who got hit, the civilians who ran in fear. Can't we just have a baseball game or something? I mean, it's crazy. They wind along this trail at their peril. Endless kilometers. You feel like you want to go back. I just wanted to go back and keep telling their stories. Ran in fear, and the attacks were repeated. Some 3,000 shells were reported to have fallen on the city today. Once there was a town with people and children and shops. Not much is left now. There was a war here. War is insane. It's crazy. I mean, hello? You're shooting at these people, and these people are shooting at you, and you both know that a lot of Families are going to be killed. One day, that's all it took. And it looks even less likely now that any multinational force or Israeli presence or even, sadly, the Lebanese army will be able to turn things around again. I call myself a fuddy-duddy dude. And I just say, this is what I saw. This is what I heard. This is what we uh, filmed. Here it is, audience. You decide what conclusions you want to draw. One small sample of what can happen in Lebanon. The battle here in the Christian sector of L.A. lasted a mere two and a half hours. The Christian phalange had come in with the Israelis. They had set up their headquarters. And then the Druze wiped them out, along with the homes of many of the families living here. Two and a half hours, that's all it took to completely devastate this place. Some people think in order to be a war correspondent, you've got to have this brilliant mind and all kinds of fancy dancy things. And I've always said you need three things. Uh, you need a smile, uh, you need stamina, and you need a cast iron stomach. Since the communist offensive began in January, Cambodian government forces have had a casualty rate of up to 5,000 dead a month. It was a war that was clearly not going to be won and was, um, and was grinding down both sides of the military conflict, but it was also imposing a, a, a brutal impact on, on the civilian population. Three rockets have hit in this area in the last five minutes, and the damage that it's done to these bodies is something that's very difficult to put into words. The pictures have to speak for themselves. Those, those are the memories that, um, that remain with one. Uh, it, it's the innocents who, uh, who pay the greatest price, there, there's no question. The crossfire will cut down more of those caught in the middle. Many able to avoid the shrapnel and the bullets will fall anyway, victims of starvation and disease. Uh, and it's something that I always felt a certain amount of guilt over was that the journalists can always leave. You can, you can go into a situation, um, you 
can uh, you can uh, record a, a, a moment of a, of a conflict, but the journalist always has the ability to say, I've had enough, I'm going home now, or I'm going back to the hotel, or I'm going to uh, go to a safer place. This is Matthew Halton of the CBC, speaking from Italy. I think he developed um, an exhilaration. He'd find an exhilaration and uh, excitement to be, uh, to be at the front during times of battle. And the sounds you can hear, if you can hear them, are the popping of machine guns in that antechamber of hell, where for more than three days, after 17 days of hard enough battle, Western Canadian troops and tanks are fighting a vicious street battle against Germans. The Canadian war correspondents were, in a sense, on side with the Allied war effort, and that was very much the case of my dad. He saw the war as uh, something of a holy crusade against the Nazis. We are often told that we should buy victory bonds because they are a good investment. But I know a much better reason. We should buy them because they help to save the lives of these grand young Canadian soldiers. They are asked to die. We are only asked to buy victory bonds. And my father was very much, I think, a vital link between uh, the troops uh, uh, on the front lines and Canadians on the home front. Corporal Mallet, what is your main memory of the Battle of Ortona? Well, my greatest memory or impression was that it was an awful mess. This is Matthew Halton of the CBC, speaking from Germany. The German war is over. It was a very solemn Young moment in most Canadian homes when CBC Gentlemen News Roundup came, uh, came on the air. The best blood of a civilization has been poured away like red wine in an orgy. And then someone tells you it's over. And your first thought is, no more Canadians will die. I am telling you today about the liberation of Paris. Paris went absolutely mad. Paris and ourselves were in a delirium of happiness yesterday and all last night and today. Yesterday was the most glorious and splendid thing I've ever seen. I think the war was the kind of spectacular climax, if you like, of his career. Some of these villages hoist the South Vietnamese government flag during the day, only to become VC enclaves at night. Well, I didn't really try to imitate any of uh, the qualities that went into my, my father's World War II broadcasting for a simple reason that I'd probably get fired if I did in today's context of, of reporting. In the last few days, between 50 and 100,000 refugees have fled across this bridge. In most cases, they've been fleeing from hunger and disease on one side of the Jordan to hunger and disease on the other. A large part of these refugees are... Today, of course, the uh, premium would be on, on appearing detached and, and being completely objective. As one UN relief official put it, the refugees are the biggest losers of the war. David Holton, CBC News on the Jordan River. We were making it up as we went along. So it was terrific, a terrific time. And, uh, you know, I'd like to think of myself, you know, as, uh, now as uh, being a you know, teeny pioneer of uh, how television news gets presented. Egypt has been described as a one-man democracy, and there is little evidence that Egyptians would have it any other way. This is nearly safer reporting in Cairo. I got there, got a cab to the hotel, then got a cab to the war. First time I saw anybody dead um, from violence. And there were lots of bodies in the desert. You'd rely on the reporter, I don't care how good or how bad the pictures are, you rely on the reporter and correspondent to bring some sense to all that stuff going on on the screen. Uh, and he can only do it by stopping and thinking. The soldiers have gone. They declared the area cleared of communists, but I noticed that they didn't go into the village, and neither have the villagers, and if you forgive me, neither will I. No one here seems eager to die in the last moments of this war. 
yes, I covered quite a few wars. I think about a dozen altogether. Over the battlefield, where the bodies of the dead are being removed, floats the sound of music. When we got past the, the, the front lines the music comes from to uh, where the Iraqi troops were retreating or had retreated the, the night before, and it was carnage. More than a mile of it. destroyed. But among the hulks of war machines, there are reminders of the human dimension of the disaster that happened here. One thing that always bothered me was the futility of wars, how, how wars start from nothing for, for no reason at all sometimes. It, and afterwards you look at it and you say, what were they thinking when they did that? Milk twice a day and a hunk of bread is the ration for this group of refugees. They are Muslims forced by Croat soldiers to leave their homes in West Mostar and come here. On a day when the cold is even too brittle for laundry, Rashida Selic can't stop working. She doesn't sleep much anymore, she says. She likes to keep busy. In war, everything is random. Death is so random. You could be in one place and you're fine. And you could be five feet over and you're not fine anymore. And you don't know. And as a journalist, you go in and yes, you face that. But people who live there, they can't get out. That's, what, that's their life. We bring in our water, we bring in a little bit of food, we come, we go, they stay. This constant activity is how she deals with her pain. In the months before Rashida finally fled, Serbian soldiers inflicted their own brand of barbarism on her. They tied her up and tried to rip off her ear with pliers. There are scars where the soldiers put out their cigarettes on her, and they raped her. Yeah. We don't have better not to talk about it, she says. And we went to see this woman, and um, she was talking to us about how they had fled their home and how they'd left things behind, and they're just basically subsisting there. And she said something to me that I've never forgotten. She said, we have nothing anymore. We are nothing. The biggest danger to a journalist in Afghanistan is uh, remote controlled roadside bombs. And the overriding impression you have being there is you have absolutely no control over that. It's pretty simple. This is a very busy road in Kabul. We were on this road traveling to an appointment a half hour before the suicide bomber struck. He came down this road in a white Corolla. When people are crowding around me, they're curious, perhaps they're hostile. There's no question I'm thinking, of, where's my exit? How do I get out of here? How fast can I do this? Let's do it once and get on the road. But this is still conservative rural Afghanistan. Here was a remote village in the most beautiful valley in northern Afghanistan. And you had to actually park your car and walk over the mountains to get to this little village uh, in the mountains. With the new school year starting here in Afghanistan, more than six million children will be going to school. That's up from a million five years ago. But it's still about three boys for every girl. And in the south, schools are still... This was a village who said to themselves, we recognize the future is education for our girls. And they had the courage and the ingenuity to find a way around the current climate. Our responsibility in Afghanistan was to tell the story beyond the fighting. I felt that very strongly. The refugees arrived with little, but they couldn't leave the pain behind. It has become part of who they are and who they will grow up to be. Their sorrow haunts them as they wait for this war to end. And I think what happens is that the more you cover war, the softer you get. Because you cover people in trauma. And it, you can't help but absorb some of that. And I think that it, it, it doesn't make me tougher. It didn't make me tougher. It made me cry more. Anna Maria Tremonti, CBC News, Zenitsa, Central Bosnia. This is Matthew Halton of the CBC, speaking from England. This is Morley Safer reporting in Nicosia. Joe Schlesinger, CBC News, Jachra, Kuwait. Peter Kent for CBC News Magazine.
and David Holt, CBC News in Rhodesia. Susan Ormiston, CBC News, Kabul. For the journal, this is Anne Medina witnessing a tragic prediction come true.